Hello, everyone. This is National Master Derek Kelly, Hello, now everyone. known as Krishna. National Master Derek Kelly, Hello, now everyone. known I'm as I'm turning Krishna. off my National sound here. So it is five o'clock in the morning in Seattle, and I believe it's in two Seattle. o'clock in Germany, central time. Uh, it's wonderful to have everybody here. This is my second lecture for chess24.com and CoChess. And the topic for today is planning in chess. So planning is a part of strategic thinking in chess. And what I like to share with my students is that basically the best way to handle strategic thinking is to do it on your opponent's turn. When you're playing in a tournament, let's say that you've got two hours for 40 moves, Basically, what Bob Vinick taught his pupils was that it was best to think about tactics and calculation on your own turn and to think about strategy while the opponent's clock was running. So to me, planning definitely falls into the category of strategy. So what exactly are we talking about when we're talking about a plan in chess? So as many of us know, what gives chess its beauty and its charm is that most positions, there are lots of possibilities available. Unless the position is tactical in nature or has a sort of straightforward solution, many positions yield themselves to all kinds of different treatments. And so planning is where we actually take a step back from what's going on in the position and we attempt to try to identify different stages. Most plans have multiple stages of what we'd like to achieve in the game. So let's just start with a game really quick here. So this is a game that I played several years ago uh, we're both experts in this game. At the time, my opponent was rated just a little bit higher rated than me. So I'm handling the white pieces. I opened up with the move pawn to d4. My opponent replied knight f6. I played c4, g6, knight c3, bishop g7. This is a position known as the king's Indian defense. So black is simply getting on with his development very quickly here. But black is also refraining from putting pawns in the center so that he can choose the structure of his central pawns more easily, uh, depending on how white replies. Most common here, white, black's gonna play the move pawn to d6, but there are gonna be situations where black could also play d5, transposing into Grunfeld. e4 though has been played by me, so this eliminates the possibility of d5 moves. d6 was played, knight f3, castles. And now I selected the move h3 which introduces a strategic position, which both players are likely to be a little bit unfamiliar with the play here. Um, I just getting a message here. Are people able to see the pieces moving? I see pieces are not moving in the chat box. Okay, I'm moving pieces, but they're not going through. That's interesting. All right, we're working to get this resolved for you. One moment here. I'm hearing it's a software glitch. Yeah, you're a god at this. <laughs> Basically. Okay, so Alex, who's helping me run this, says he sees H3 on the board. So I don't know if that means he only sees H3 or sees up to the move on to H3. Okay, so I'm being asked to go again from the start. So let's start all over here. So right now I'm just introducing the first moves to a game that I played against a player, Michael Lin. So I'm starting out move D4, D4 is now shown on the board. 
So I'm handling white, d4, knight f6 by black, c4. And I'm just gonna check from all my different chat boxes and stuff. I see yes, fine now, okay now, and you're a god at this, question mark. I like that question. So I believe everybody can see, I believe everybody can see what's happening, right? Okay, so it seems like everything's all right. So C4, G6, Bishop G7. I think since we have that little technical difficulty, I actually think I'll rush ahead just a little bit here so we can get to a position that involves some kind of strategic thinking. So I've, I've played the opening relatively quickly here, but what we're looking at is a sideline. Usually white doesn't play H3 so early on in the game. And then we have this move G4. So just before the move G4, I think it's a good time to start. So most of what I talk about in strategy, I base from a little book called The Middle Game in Chess by Zinoska Borowski. And in that book, he basically shared that chess is composed of three different components, what he was calling time, space, and material. So in this position, Time refers to how many moves each side appears to have made. So this is kind of a wacky concept because it depends on the value of the moves which have been made too, whether or not this metric that Zanoska Borowski developed works. But it, it's very simple, so I wanna share it with you. This bishop appears to have made one move from its starting square. So we would count this as one move being made. This pawn appears to have made one move, that's a second move, third move, fourth move, fifth move. This move is twice because it takes two pawns, two moves for a pawn to get to d5. So this counts as two, this is one, one. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine moves for white. And because nothing has gone drastically wrong here, we should also find nine moves for black. So I'll use a different color. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then castling counts as one. So that's nine. So basically in this case, this metric is only proving that both sides have, nobody's lost a tempo here. Each side has made one move and the other side has made a move. We haven't had any backwards moves. We haven't had any captures that have eliminated a piece which has moved several times. You guys, this is gonna be the last technical difficulty. I'm gonna to have to grab something from my notes. Okay, last problem, I promise. Okay, so both sides have made an equal amount of moves when it comes to time. Now the next metric available is space or material. So let's start with material. Obviously in this position, both sides have conserved all of their material. There's been no exchanges whatsoever. But let's, let's, Let's imagine that it's Black's move here and Black's having a good think. Maybe he's thinking for about five minutes here. So the way that I like to use Botvinnik's principle of thinking about strategy is to expand upon the idea of materials. So rather than just asking myself whether materials equal, does anybody have an advantage? Something else we could do here is we could make some comparisons about the different pieces and their relative value. So for example, if I take a look at my dark squared bishop compared to his dark squared bishop, it looks like my bishop is slightly more valuable because my bishop is not obstructed by pawns in the center, is playing an active role in the game, and Black's bishop is obstructed by pawns in the center and also has very little it can do here. It's not really an active participant in the position. Now, this is, this is just a small talk I'm having with myself. But during the opponent's time, I find that this is incredibly useful. I'll be very honest with you that I don't really teach a lot of planning to my students because more or less what happens is that games are won and lost because of blunders and important mistakes. Kasparov said it best. He said, chess is won by the player who makes the second to last mistake. So many times, one of the big advantages of doing this kind of work, even of thinking strategically and doing plans, is that it's also helping you to kind of map out in your brain where all the pieces are. So I really like this idea of comparing the pieces. Right now we've started with the dark squared bishops, we'll move on to other things. 
but it also kind of helps to create like a map within your mind, within your brain, so that it'll be easier and easier for you to avoid making blunders when it's time to start thinking about tactics and calculation. If you keep this balance of thinking about strategy on your own turn and then calculation and tactics, sorry, you want to think about strategy on your opponent's time. And then you want to think about tactics and calculation on your own time. If you keep this alive, this balance alive, then you'll find it easier to avoid blunders because you've made it that your calculation is happening on your own terms. So you've made that into a smaller thing that you devote your total energy on your own time. And then strategically by doing this kind of stuff, by just looking for the very simple things. So right now we've looked at who appears to have made how many moves. We've seen that nothing has really changed there. And now we're comparing the pieces. We'll get to planning in just a second. So I'm comparing the dark squared bishops. I feel that white's dark squared bishop is slightly better because it's not blocked by the pawns and it's playing a more active role in the position. If we compare light squared bishops, I think they're about equivalent. Maybe there's a slight case that black's light squared bishop is a little bit better because it's not hampered by the pawns in the center, but it also doesn't have very much scope. At the moment, it can only go to d7. And then from there, there's practically nowhere for it to go. It can go to e8. Otherwise, that's it, because there's nowhere for the bishop to go without being captured here. So that would be the bishops. The knights. Well, both knights have developed on the king side to their natural square. This knight is pinned, and that's part of white's strategy in this position. This knight is pinned on f6. This knight is attempting to get to an outpost on c5. So in fact, black appears to have really good pieces going with the knights, because this knight is looking for an outpost. This knight is pinned, but is on its regular square. So everything looks good there. So now we could also compare queens and rooks, but everything seems about the same there. That's pretty obvious. Last thing to talk about is space. And there are different ways of looking at space, but for now, let's just talk about the fact that the white pawn on d5 is far more advanced than the pawn on d6. And as a result, this pawn is helping to restrict the bishop here. Usually it would be restricting the knight also, but here black has gone out of his way to find a solution to that. But these pawns in the center still have the effect of making it a little bit more difficult for black to coordinate all of his forces. And over time, this could become a real issue for black if eventually white is able to liberate the pawns on the queen side. So this is a3, b4. If white is eventually able to achieve this and then push c5, he'll also have the space advantage that's pretty commanding on the queen side and which will allow him to start to create threats in that area. So now we've done the basic work. Everything we've talked about so far does not take that much chess skill to be able to work out. We've just looked at time, space, and material in a fairly dry way involving a little bit of comparisons. And I highly recommend this kind of stuff on your opponent's turn. I highly recommend it. Even if it doesn't seem to yield any huge results, as I've said before, it's also helping to create kind of a solid image in your mind of what it is, what the position really looks like. And this tends to reduce blunders. But now when we start looking at plans, things get a little bit more tricky. Okay, so planning is about anticipating stages of how we can unfold the game. That's basically what a plan is. It's a multiple stage idea about how the game can unfold. And a lot of positions don't lend themselves to this kind of thinking, but still on some level, we've got to get there. I said this in my last video and I'll say it again. I really think that what holds strategy together is the idea of a threat. Ultimately, at some point, you have to have some kind of threat in the position. When we're talking about strategy, we're talking about a distant threat. So the threat will not be immediately evident. It's not going to be as simple as, oh, I'm threatening to take a pawn or I'm threatening to take a piece. Instead, the threat is going to be down the road somewhere. So really quick before we keep Okay, so I've got, I just want to check and see what people are saying, because this time I, I want to stay. All right, so I don't see anything, anybody asking any crucial questions. So, so far, I think everybody's together on this. 
So we're looking for some kind of distant threat in the position. One of the most common ways to think about planning in order to start to identify where these threats might take place is to look at each different sector of the board to divide the board into three different parts. We've got the king side, the queen side, and the center. So many of you will be familiar with this. Some of you may not be. Okay, so king side would be the anything which is happening on this side of the board, F, G, and H files, right? Center would be E and D, roughly speaking. And then we could consider this, the yellow, to be the queen side of the board. All right, so I'm gonna remove these as best as I can. That's gone, that's gone, that's gone. This is gone. So by dividing the board into three sectors, then we can start to identify which areas are gonna be the most likely for us to develop our play on. So this is a very common way to think about planning is to start to think, okay, so what, if I'm handling the white pieces and it's Black's move, so I'm thinking about strategy on his turn while he's thinking. And so I'm asking myself, okay, what are my chances of launching an attack on the king side? And what would that look like? Well, perhaps I could play moves like queen d2 and bishop h6. That could be one way of trying to infiltrate and then after the exchange of bishops, ideally in that kind of position, you would want your queen to arrive on the h6 square, and then you'd want also to bring the knight to g5 and the attacking h7. Problem with this idea here is that the knight on f6 is doing a very good job of defending the pawn on h7. So this plan doesn't look so reasonable of infiltrating the h6 square and then attacking h7. Where am I getting this kind of plan from? Well, it's typical. This is a typical way of trying to take advantage of a fianchettoed kingside position. We call this a fianchetto when the bishop is on g7. So basically, black's king position is slightly compromised because of the movement of the pawn to g6 and the position of the bishop on g7. And so as a result, here, one plan would be to attempt this, but this doesn't look like this is going to work. So this can be ruled out. Doesn't mean we're out of ideas on the king side. So the other plan is the one which actually happens in the game. One, another plan could be g4, and then maybe we could even castle queen side, bring the rooks over and look for a pawn storm using the g6 pawn as what we call a lever. So we'll bring pieces over to the king side, play for the move pawn to h5, and then attempt to capture on g6 or maybe push the pawn to h6 and start breaking through and infiltrating the king side that way. This could be another plan. So these are the plans I came up with on the king side. This is just some kind of trial and error. Obviously, it's very helpful to be familiar no matter what position you're looking at. It's very useful to be familiar with previous games or previous analysis of positions which are similar to what you've looked at. So I, I don't teach people to try to avoid opening theory because this is one of the best places where you're going to learn this stuff. Everything which happened here, in fact, has happened before. This position is not brand new. And I was aware of some of the plans which are available, but still I want to make sure that I emphasize that this is one of the best ways to think about planning is to start to think in terms of three sectors of the board and look at the possibilities of plans there. So here we found one aggressive plan for white having to do with a pawn storm on the king side. And similarly, I've already mentioned that white can also think about some sort of advance on the queen side by gradually advancing the queen side pawns there. So. I'm erasing my highlights here. Please bear with me for just a moment. Another plan could be they were an even high break. This is what would be holding together the plans on the queen side. Eventually, one wants to break through with b5 and then perhaps make a capture on d6, open the c file, 
infiltrate on C7 or D6. I know I'm saying that pretty fast, but this is the essential plan that tends to occur in these kinds of positions.
Can people hear me? Can people hear me and see me? Um, let's see. You are live. Yes. Okay. So I'm I'm audible again. So somebody pointed to the correct plan. I just saw that in the feed there that somebody knows the idea about B3. We'll we'll keep that on our own. Let's say the opponent moves, okay? Ideally in a strategic search, we would also be looking for similar ideas for our opponent. All right. So Queen E8 was played in this position. I'll clear out these highlights. So Queen E8 was played. That's the last move here. So the idea of Queen E8 in this position is what? Well, let's let's actually do the work. Let's look at the king side, the center, and the queen side from Black's point of view. So from Black's point of view on the king side, the best option to try to create some kind of play is to play for the move pawn to f5. And then this pawn can either capture on e4 or the pawn can move all the way down to f4. Different approaches here. So the move queen to e8, in fact, is helping to prepare that move f5 by allowing the knight to come out of the pin. So the knight can now move to d7, perhaps it can move to h5, and this would be one of the ideas there. So this is the idea which is available on the king side. Difficult to imagine any other kind of plan. The center is absolutely not yielding too much idea, but still it's possible to think of one. We could pressure the pawn on e4, maybe try to undermine the center with c6 or potential b5. And then finally, on the queen side, it's possible to imagine eventual advancements of the A pawn or the B pawn. But Black's position here is a little bit more passive than White's position. This is the virtue of White having the right to move first. And also the opening that Black has selected is giving White a space advantage, which is helping White to constrict some of the options. So we've talked about this position a lot. Um, it sounds like some viewers have joined in on Twitch Coaches. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me. This is National Master Derek Kelly. I now go by Krishna. I've had this name for a few years. Um, so I go by Krishna now, but it's me. You've recognized me probably from my YouTube channel, which is very popular. Thank you for joining us. Today, we're talking about planning. And I've emphasized, first of all, that I think it's most important to think about strategy on your opponent's turn, when your opponent's clock is running. And this is more easy to do in tournament games with longer time controls than it is to do it with blitz games, for example, right? You don't have so much time to think about this stuff. But what I've emphasized so far, time, space, material, looking at these three elements. And then I've also talked about thinking in terms of three sectors of the board and identifying what your long-term threats could be. And that's the basic gist of making a plan, in my opinion. So my move G4, in fact, is to assist me with the plan of potentially creating a pawn storm on the king side. And it's also meant as preventative for Black's idea of playing pawn to F5. So now if Black ever plays pawn to F5, I'll capture there and the G file will be open and this will give me a clear shot at the king. So G4 was played, knight D7. So this is... This is the main move, queen d2. So as I said before, now this plan of bishop h6 and knight g5 becomes possible. Black played knight d to c5. I castled. This makes the position very risky. So at this stage, everything we've said has some merit here because white now definitely has the plan of bishop h6 followed by knight g5. There's also the plan of a pawn storm. And then for black, the idea of playing on the queen side is now quite relevant because both sides have castled on opposite sides. Whenever you have opposite sides castling, this is basically a signal that both sides can throw their full resources at attacking the opponent's king. I probably had a sense during the game that this position is probably close to equal or black should have sufficient counterplay here. But I like this kind of position because it's really going to test the understanding of both sides. And as you'll see, right away my opponent makes a crucial mistake. 
So I've, I've written here in my notes that bishop d7 looks like the best move. Clearly, he needs to be preparing to play moves like c6 and b5. There's no question about it. And if you look right here with Stockfish, black is actually better. If white is too gung-ho about his attack, black will be getting a, quite a nice position very quickly by taking on d5, bringing the rook to c8, or pushing the pawn to b5. This will turn out to be sufficient. But there's nerves involved, right? If you're sitting here and you're playing against the national master and he's emitted these moves, castling queenside and stuff like this, there's a possibility of, of getting a little shaky and doing the wrong thing. And this is what my opponent did. He plays f5, which is atrocious. This is terrible. This just opens the door now for me to begin my attack on the king side. So I take with the g pawn. He recaptures. I played rook dg1. I wrote in my notes, I already think this is a force win for white. Black is moving way too slow with his own plan. White's moving right ahead with attacking chances. So king h8 was played, bishop h6, everything that we discussed, in fact. So all of our planning has been very useful. This position is horrid. This is a terrible position for black and, and a very easy victory. So only here then was it necessary to do some calculation. Now it's my, it's my turn. I get to think, 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 think. I thought for a while and, and the move knight h4 just looked very clear to me. I even calculated this rook g6 move. This is a little bit fancy and unnecessary. Obviously, knight g6 check would automatically win material, but rook g6 is upping the ante a little bit. If he takes, then of course the queen is lost entirely. The rook moved, now I'm bringing in the other rook. I teach the three piece rule. If there's three pieces near the king, you've got a really good chance of attack. This is like five pieces near the king. So almost anywhere you look, there's gonna be destruction. Rook e6, fancy, fancy. You sacrifice the queen. And then he's still not out of dodge. Even here, there's difficulty after bishop h5. If the rook goes to g7, then clearly the move queen to f6, and there'll be further material gains for white. He'll have to move here. I'll probably take on g7 and then take on e6, and it's, it's total destruction. I'm up a queen and a bishop for a rook. And if rook comes to f8, there must be queen e7 or queen g5 here. Anyway, that was a very successful outcome of the plan. Everything I said about the king side plan ended up happening in this game. How did I do it? Start out with time space material, investigate what's happening in the position. And then I split the board into three different sectors and it's all connected by the idea of a distant threat. You need some ultimate threat. So in this case, it was the idea of infiltrating or pawn storming the king. And this was successful in this case. Black, if he would have thought in exactly the same method, which I showed here, would have identified early on that the possibility of playing c6 and b5 and bishop d7, those are actually part of a queen side plan. But my opponent clearly didn't understand that it was important to start playing on the queen side in this position and fell apart very quickly. This is a very easy win against an expert in this position in the King's Indian. So I, I would have to call this a successful game. I'll check really fast to see if there are any questions before I move on to the next game. So I don't, I, I'm not seeing what's happening on the coach us there. Is your opponent blundering all the time? Well, he must not be blundering all the time because he's in his late 21, I mean, his late 2100s, he's in his high 2100s, right? So he's almost in the top 10% of chess players. So he can't be blundering all the time, but almost all chess players blunder almost every game. There are significant mistakes made by both sides. This happens every game. This is what gives chess its charm. If chess was a little bit easier like tic-tac-toe, we probably wouldn't be meeting and having these kinds of dialogues because it wouldn't afford us that much, that much to work with, right? But here you've got a lot to think about because there are lots of mistakes being made all the time. If you're very focused, if you talk, use the kinds of thinking techniques that I've identified here, and then you also have experience, so you know the opening, you know what can take place, 
you'll be able to minimize those mistakes. And that's, that's what this conversation here is all about. Tactics and calculation on your own turn, strategy on the opponent's turn. Of course, when the opponent is thinking. Of course, familiarity is going to help a lot. So let me now move on to another game here. Again, a game between two players rated at the expert level. Similar to the last game, let's just rush ahead. This is the Banco Gambit. But let's, let's make this, since it's a planning situation, in fact, let's make it a little bit more abstract by, by refraining from talking about the opening too much and just jumping ahead to a position where we can start talking about planning. So yes, we could have a nice little conversation about the Banco. I'd love to have one. Perhaps I'll do it on a YouTube video sometime or, or whatnot. And by the way, of course, I do want to tell people I offer private instructional lessons. I have really good results with my students. You can find out more about it at chessopenings.com slash lessons. So that's available. And I do enjoy talking about openings and middle games, tactics, end games, game analysis, master games. Everything happens in my lessons with excellent results. Very enjoyable. That's going well for me and for my students. So here we go. We've reached a position here. It's Black's turn. Let's say that Black is having a long think right now. Black is, is sitting in his chair. He's holding his temples a little bit, getting situated and comfortable for the game. What to do? Very simple. Time, space, material. I love this thing because it's just so doggone simple. It doesn't always yield results which are totally comprehensible, but it at least gives us something to begin the process so that we're not just grasping for straws. We're not just jumping into the position. We have a very clear way. So when Zinoz Kabrowski was talking about time, he was talking about it as being one of the actual components of how chess is played. I make a move, you make a move. I make a move, you make a move. That's what how chess works. So when Zinoz Kabrowski is talking about time, he literally advised count how many moves appear to have been made in the position. So the white knight makes one move. The rook to b1 counts as one move. The pawn on d5 counts as two moves. So we're up to four, five, six, seven, eight. We count castling as one. So white appears to have made eight moves here. Yes, there is a pawn missing in this position. White is missing a pawn. We don't count that. So that's how he did the technique. He just doesn't bother about it. You just see eight moves. Who knows what happened to that pawn? Maybe it never existed. Of course it did. All right. For black, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's eight to seven with black to move. This is normal. There has been no significant change in the normal situation. White starts out the game at the very initial position. It's zero to zero. Then white makes a move. It's one to zero. We still have the same thing going on. It's eight to seven with black to move. For this reason, Zinoz Kabrowski actually counted the right to move as a half tempo because it's the average between zero and one. Might sound a little strange, but if you think about it, it makes sense because chess is actually dynamically happening. He counts the right to move as a half tempo. So here we could say that white is up a half tempo because it's eight to seven with black having the right to move. That's also the case at the beginning of the game. It was zero to zero with white having the right to move. White was up a half a tempo. So nothing has changed. Nothing dramatic has happened in terms of time. Now with space, there are different ways to count space. Again, for the purposes of today's conversation, let's just look at the pawn structure. White has a very far advanced pawn on D5. That's somewhat helping to constrain Black's position. But in this position, Black actually seems to be maneuvering around it just fine. So just like we've seen in the other games, basically it appears to me, oh, trying to make less noise and I've made more. Basically it appears to me that the most, the way that this pawn is most likely to play a role as a space advantage is if white is able to bring this pawn up to e5. 
this will be very similar. In fact, if you're able to catch the analogy between this game and the previous one, where there was a C pawn that was neighboring the D pawn. And I also said there that if the pawn, the neighboring white pawn could reach C5, then the space advantage could be turned into account. So this is one of the ways that we utilize an advanced pawn. Another way of thinking about this is that pawns like to march abreast. They like to be side by side. So if you can get that E pawn up to the E5 square, all of a sudden that D pawn will also be shining because if an exchange takes place, the D pawn will be liberated to advance further. And if an exchange of pawns doesn't take place on E5, eventually the D pawn could be used to help support the advance to E6. Also, white may consider capturing on d6 and then use the d6 pawn as a weakness to start attacking. Or, let me clear all of these. Another way that the e pawn could move up to e5 eventually and play a role is the e pawn could move up. Let's show that on the board. It could be captured, an exchange could happen, and then the e7 pawn could become a weakness on the open E file and the D pawns advanced placement will help to make that into a factor. So this is real stuff. It might look like a very small factor, this little pawn on D5, and yet it does actually contribute to the position. It does yield white, a space advantage. For the purposes of today, I feel like that's enough to say about that. Oh boy, to say that black has an advantage in space on the queen side is a debatable matter because there's something else happening here. Black played a gambit. So black is also down a pawn in this position. So it looks like there's some space advantage on the queen side, but in reality, that's really not so because by the time white plays a4, for example, we could just as easily argue that white is doing well. So on the queen side, so white has the space advantage here. The time is also just a little bit in white's favor and the material whites up a pawn. But if you remember, I said in the previous one that I also like to do a piece by piece comparison. And hopefully we'll find, I'm hoping for black that we'll find that the piece by piece comparison is in his favor a little bit because otherwise this position is not starting to sound so good for black. So let's start with both sides. Kings are castled, the heavy pieces maybe that's where we start to see a little bit of a difference. This rook on a8 is obviously doing quite a bit better than this rook on b1. It's on a wide open file with potential targets on a2. For example, one of the threats to be aware of in this kind of position is bishop to c4. I'm going to check into my little chat feed here make sure everybody is doing well. So I haven't been able to see things on the YouTube channel, but I, I don't see that anybody's asking anything there. So we're good there. Does D6 not count? So, so Drunk Chess asked, does D6 not count? I don't understand really what that question, what that question is, does it not count? So maybe you're talking about the, the time. So did I, did I fail to count it when we did time? Let's try again. One for the Bishop, two, I'm gonna use yellow, one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Did I miss that earlier? It's possible. All right. I, I agree. Maybe I overlooked that. So good question. So perhaps black is up a half a tempo, which would make more sense. He's playing a gambit after all. So if we were to track where that where that tempo happened, it's probably because in the process of capturing on a6, we've helped black to develop his bishop on a6 and we lost the pawn, so we lost the tempi which were associated with that pawn. That's just a, a basic understanding. The C pawn, the pawn which has disappeared from the board, made one, two, three moves, and in the process probably helped black to develop, and the three tempi are gone because the pawn is gone. That's the way to think about it. So very good question there. So in fact, black is the one up a half a tempo, and as we're also seeing, the rook on a8 is a little bit better off than the rook on b1, maybe a lot better off in the current situation. White would like to see that change. If he can get that to change, that'll be a big step in, in improving his position and taking advantage of the extra pawn. Let's move on to minor pieces. The bishops, the let's 
compare king's bishops here. So there's different ways to look at bishops. You can either compare light squared bishops to light squared bishops and dark squared bishops to dark squared bishops, or you can compare king's bishops to king's bishops, the bishops that start near the king, and queen's bishops to queen's bishops. And if I have enough time, I like to do both, both different kinds of comparisons. So here, the king's bishops, I would have to say at the moment that black's king's bishop is preferable to white's king bishop. Why? Because this bishop has a wide open diagonal and this bishop is stifled presently by the position of the pawn on d5. So black's king's bishop looks a little bit better than white's king's bishop. Now, let's talk about bishops on the queen side. On the queen side, I also would be tempted to favor black's bishop in this position because it's bearing down on the e2 pawn. And as I was just saying before I saw that little question there, this bishop can also get tucked into c4 and create some threats here. So it looks like it's playing a more active role. White's bishop, on the other hand, is a little ways off from having any constructive threat. But there are threats available, as we saw in the previous game. One idea would involve playing for an eventual bishop h6. That's possible. Another idea might involve placing the bishop on g5 and creating pressure against e7. That took me a long time to understand that about Banco Gambit positions. And as I said before, if this is assisted by rook e1 and e5, this can be a very strong plan. But even without that happening, the bishop on g5 can still play a role by tickling that pawn on e7 and making it a little bit more difficult for black to engage in active plans of his own because he'll need to defend that pawn a little bit. So the the bishop on c1 also has some bite to it, whether that's clearly recognized now or not. But I would say I slightly prefer black's queen's bishop because it's a little bit closer to generating threats. This word threats is such a nifty little word in chess. I love that word because in chess, that's what it all comes down to ultimately. Whenever you're sitting at a board and you just don't know how to get your bearings whatsoever, you don't know how to make a plan, you don't know how to think strategically, you've never seen this position before. Well, you can rest assured that ultimately it's gonna come down to both sides pursuing some kind of threat. And a threat usually at some point entails winning material. So even here, we're talking about E7 or targeting D6 way down the road for white, or it's gonna be a threat of immediately checkmating the king. And that's what the idea of Bishop H6 is involving is looking to checkmate the king. You can almost always, I can't even think of times that are exceptional, nearly always you can find your bearings just by thinking of the idea of a threat. Maybe if you're playing for a draw for a perpetual check or a stalemate, maybe for the first time you're not thinking in terms of threat, but 90% of positions, this is, a, this is a very good rule of thumb. And incidentally, just by talking about time, space, and material, We've already started to hit on some of the plans here. We've already identified a potential kingside plan for white. We've identified a potential plan for attacking the center here for white also. Let's finish up the piece by piece comparisons. The knights, I think are roughly equivalent. Maybe I prefer white's knights a little bit more because my knight on c3 looks a little bit more aggressively placed than the knight on d7. And the plan for this guy is potentially to infiltrate the b5 square. Plans, now we get to talk about planning. And let's hope that our opponent is still thinking, thinking, thinking. By the way, when I'm using Botvinnik's rule of thinking about strategy on my opponent's turn and tactics and calculation on my turn, there are times when I'm not a stickler. Again, if this is a tournament game and he, boom, he hit me with queen a5 and I was still getting my bearings, this might be a good time to continue thinking strategically and break the Botvinnik rule just for a little while so that we could actually complete the search, you know, so that we really get one good strategic foothold before we start calculating. And the strategic contours of a position don't tend to change too drastically move by move. So once you've done a really thorough strategic analysis, once the idea, the what you have found tends to stick and tends to be reasonable down the road. But again, you're gonna keep renewing it as the opponent is using up his clock time. But let's imagine our opponent is still thinking and we've got the luxury of thinking further about potential plans. 
So now let's break the board down into three parts. Kingside, if I'm handling white here, where are my kingside plans? Well, they basically consist of bishop h6. If I can, if I can somehow scoot this bishop into h6, so that would probably entail, first of all, moving the bishop to a preliminary square like f4 or g5, then queen d2, and then bishop h5, and then a plan like knight g5. We saw this plan in the previous game. That could be one plan. Another kingside plan, if I'm being really imaginative here, could be to play e4 and then eventually to support that. Uh, let me clear these first. So I could play e4. And then I could support that with f4 and f5 and then start taking on g6 and create some difficulty that way. Or I could play e4, e5, take on e5. And then under certain circumstances, this will also allow an attack. That's getting kind of difficult to see. Let me do this again. e4, f4, e5 takes. And then maybe at some point e6, for example, and I would have the beginnings of an attack. So yes an attack on the king's side is feasible and could happen. A central attack we've also described could occur after the move, e4 to e5, supported by rook e1. And now there are multiple ways that this structure could play out, but in all cases, there are ways for white to conceive of an attack in the center, perhaps taking on d6 and then targeting the d6 pawn itself. Perhaps Black is generous enough because I would consider that to be an act of generosity. If he actually captures on e5, then we'll have all kinds of open play here and we'll be able to, so let's show this again, boom, boom. And let's imagine that he takes, the e file will then be open. We can target e7. We could push d6, especially if it comes with a threat to a8. And there's gonna be all kinds of exciting, juicy things happening there. But it's all held together by a simple plan, which is the discussion of today. The plan is to play for e5. That could also be a plan here. Finally, queenside plans. There are queenside plans here too. Queenside plan generally entails playing a4. And because we have an extra pawn on that side of the board, basically my understanding, I'm not totally clear on this because I don't actually see the Benko too terribly often, but I would consider the, the basic plan to be to play b4 and to elicit an exchange of pawns on the b4 square so that the a pawn lives on and becomes a passer and then we would gradually want to move that pawn up the board. b4 is basically to try to liberate our pieces and find more squares for them because as we identified that's where black has his only real advantages in this position in terms of peace placement. Has to do with his rook on a8 and his bishop on a6. Those factors will become smaller if we're able to open up our game on the queen side, especially by playing b4. But it has to be done in a timely fashion because when you play b4, you're gonna leave some weaknesses along this diagonal. The knight will be weak. The a pawn itself may turn into a weakness rather than an asset. So those are the plans as far as I can tell. And of course, let's say that, that black doesn't capture, then certainly I would like to move ahead with pawn to b5 and then use two passers, start moving those passers up the board. I'm waving my hands like this, but people probably can't see. So I'm, I'm shooing the pawns forward. Move, 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 little pawns, go forward. All right, so it's five, oh, 5.59 my time. We're almost to the end, but wouldn't you know it, I bet you many of the things I talked about happened. There you see a4. There you see b3, there you see e4, here you see the rook potentially being behind this pawn. Still looks like I'm playing for e5 here. Do we see black making use of his best factors? No. So now that rook on a8 is not looking like an asset anymore because it's now, it's now just pushed up against here. Black would have liked to have played c4 at the right moment in these kinds of positions, but right now, whenever he plays c4, b4 can be played and I'll have connected passers. This position, my dear friends, is becoming a disaster and Stockfish agrees. What could Black have done differently? I'm sure I talked about it somewhere in here, or one could also look at games to find out how Black has typically handled these kinds of positions. So he played knight e5, I took, he took. I played knight a2, that seems to be not the best move. Immediately b4 was actually possible. 
I played knight a2, he played e6. I played bishop c3, exchange, 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 exchange. So what have we here? Well, the position in fact has transposed into the plan of e4 to e5 takes on d6. Black brought, the, brought that position to us without us having to go all the way. So now the pawn on d6 is a weakness. The queen side play is also favoring white. So an exchange took place. I know I'm going fast here because I, I just realized we're running out of time. All right, and my technique, I don't think was flawless in this game at all. All right, the d6 pawn was overcome, but I did it in a way that was not the best. So, so as Kasparov says, chess is won by the player who makes the second last mistake. At this point in the game, black was actually close to equality, but I did end up winning the game after just a couple little inaccuracies here. So he took on there, I took here. At this phase of the game, I'm still up a pawn, but he has the ability to take on d5 and doesn't do it for some reason. He plays rook e2. And after that move with queen f4, that was probably a time pressure mistake. Now he's back to just being down a pawn. Rook takes f2, or actually he still gets the pawn, but it's not enough. He's down a pawn now, and now I have two pawns here. Well, the theme of today's lesson was planning. So without this game was not nearly as elegant as the last game was because there was a time here where black could have equalized and this has to do with imprecisions on my part too. Chess is full of them. Chess is full of mistakes for both sides and chess is gonna be won by the player that makes the second last mistake. But I do think we did our topic of planning justice. I think that I showed time space material, the concept of thinking about strategy on your opponent's turn. And then we also talked about breaking the position down into three sectors, queen side, center, and king side. And we talked about threats and the importance of threats, even distance threats as a way to do your planning. So I feel satisfied. Uh, thank you guys for joining me today. I'll, I'll, I'll look in really fast. Um, yes, somebody says, thank you for your chessopenings.com. Once again, I do have a YouTube channel. You can find it very easily by going to chessopenings.com. That's the simplest way to find it. But if you search for chess openings on YouTube, you're bound to find me. Thank you guys for your very kind remarks here. Thank you for your questions. Oh, Tartakower said that. I've been saying Kasparov all along. I'll have to look that up. So somebody's saying the quote is Tartakower. I'm assuming that's the one about chess is made by the player who makes the second last mistake. Certainly sounds so much more authoritative if Kasparov said it. And I've said it a million times. So I'll have to check that. But anyway, I don't see questions there. Uh, looks like I've handled everything. So thank you guys. I'm going to end the broadcast. Thank you for watching. Uh, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.